called Random Rolls. We're going to start with talking about everybody's talking about Jamie because everyone's talking about it. But then we're going to kind of jump into some some other past notable works of yours. So why do you want to be a drag queen? Because it's all I ever dream of. And when I close my eyes, it's all I can see. Now, you told Entertainment Weekly that you did do a lot of drag race binge watching in preparation. I'm curious, what were the big takeaways from that? Is there, is there anything you really gleaned from that that helped inform the performance? Well, I'd never seen drag before. And um, I, Jonathan Buttrell, the director, introduced me to an avant-garde drag artist in England called David Hoyle, who is from the north of England. He's the same age as I am. And his vulnerability and his bravery, that combination is something that I was so struck by. Um, and when I saw him perform in front of an audience, he was, he just went out right on a limb. And I thought that was, you know, that was inspiring to see, mm. in, in, you know, the best, best kind of performance artist you, you could hope for. And I then watched, as you know, three weeks worth, <laughs> over three weeks, 11 series of RuPaul's Drag Race, and the struggle that is in almost every one of those drag queens, mm. either the prejudice of their family or in society to fulfill their dream and to, you know, the amount of rejection that they have at every level and just the talent and the chutzpah and the sheer, whatever it takes, steel to get through there whilst throwing shade and being vulnerable <laughs> and... <laughs> You know all of that stuff. It's it's a it's an extraordinary, unique combination of talent. I want to take this opportunity to sort of transition into "Can You Ever Forgive Me," which is just still one of my favorite films in in the last few years. You're friends with um, Julia Steinberg. Somebody. Yeah. She's not an agent anymore. She died. She did. Jesus, that's young. Maybe she didn't die. Maybe she just moved back to the suburbs. I always confuse those two. No, that's right. She got married and had twins. Better to have died. Indeed. I mean, Jack, Jack Hawk is this beautiful character. What, what did you learn from that experience, uh, from playing Jack? What, what really came out of that for you? I was friends with a new, um, an actor who was in Chariots of Fire called Ian Charlson, who died of AIDS in 1990. Huh. And he, he had this, he had a little boy lost quality on the one hand, an openly debauched kind of lifestyle um, in terms of, you know, what very orthodox people would go, well, you know, wouldn't approve of that way of living. But he was so life-embracing and non-judgmental. And I thought those were the qualities that Jack Hawk had. And I thought if anybody, because Jack Hawk in real life died of AIDS, as he does in the, in the, at the end of the movie, um, that was as close an homage to a, person that I knew very well and had worked with a couple of times. Um, so that's, I suppose that was my route into trying to understand who and what he was. I've been so, it's just been, you know, someone that's loved your work for quite some time. It's been so amazing to see, you know, for example, you popping up in, in Loki in a, in a Disney series in the MCU this year. That's been one of the great joys of this year. Breathe so I can ask several thousand questions. So I've got to keep moving so we don't die. I can get behind that. What's your plan? Don't die. Okay, understood, but beyond that. Don't die. Don't die. I have to ask about the costume. I know you've lamented the lack of muscles built into the suit, but what else can you tell me about that costume? Well, another role <laughs> in tights. Uh, <laughs> yes. I didn't have high heels, but I had little yellow booties and you know, this Kermit-like <laughs> collar. Yes, it is kermit um, there is, there is, you know, there is a moment, I think in, I think it's every actor will identify with this, that where you put on the tights and you've got this sort of woolly, baggy, wide front, pants over your tights at the front and a cloak and horns on your head and you walk out in front of 120 crew members in a studio in Atlanta who you've never met before. And my expectation was that they would go, you have got to be kidding. Where are your muscles? <laughs> or, you know, can you be taken seriously? But of course, you know, that, that's, that's the fear that you have. Um, mm -hmm. And I suppose that's what keeps you, keeps you going. You know, the same thing happened when I was, in the full Loco Chanel gear, I thought, what is the reaction going to be when I <laughs> totter out there at six foot eight with the wig and the heels and the double 36D brassiere? Um, so 
there's always that moment you think, um, um, is somebody <laughs> going to rumble me and go, uh, uh, you, you, <laughs> you haven't got this gig right. <laughs> now, while we're talking massive, massive, massive global franchises, of course, you are in The Rise of Skywalker as General Pride. As I served you in the old wars, I serve you now. I, forgive me, I don't know if I know the story of how that role, you came to that role, and I'm wondering if you could tell me that story. Um, I got sent, as actors do know, um, mm. a generic uh, interrogation scene. It was clearly from a 1940s B war movie. <laughs> and I taped it, and you, know, you set it off into cyberspace. You'd never hear anything again. And then about three or four months later, I got a call from my agent saying, J.J. Abrams, who's casting Star Wars, wants to see you at Pinewood Studios. And I said, because of a tape that I'd done, I said, well, no, I, I've never auditioned for this. And she said, well, you have. And I argued with her and I said, no, I can, I can tell you. you know, I've been a fan of Star Wars <laughs> since I was 20. If I had auditioned for Star Wars, I would remember that. Can you send it back to me? So she did. And then I realized that it, you know, it had nothing to do with Star Wars, no script of Star Wars at all. So... Um, I got the idea of what they were after and then went and met J.J. Abrams in the Carrie Fisher building. I knew Carrie really well. And wow. as I walked in, he was sitting with um, Daisy Ridley. And I thought, oh, right, am I reading in with her or you know, what's the deal? And I think five minutes in the door, he said, so you're going to do the part? And that, that's when the room literally felt like it went upside down. He told me the name of the part and the plot but i didn't listen to any of that because i just i saw his mouth moving i just thought wow i'm going to be in the final star wars movie is this real <laughs> is this really going to happen and then i subsequently found out that i had got this part and you had to go into a conference room where they had bodyguards and closed circuit cameras you have to leave your phone behind and you read the script and then you leave again and on the day you would only get sort of a plastic folder with your dialogue printed on red paper so you couldn't photograph it um, and you had to learn it from then and then you had to sign it off and hand it in at the end of the day. The secrecy was Fort Knox like. So it was an extraordinary experience. And I didn't tell, I didn't need to tell my family the name of my character because mm. for fear of being fired or it going out on the internet in some shape or form. And that's, you know, the Disney police would come and break my knees. <laughs> The Disney police, right? <laughs> you know, it's pretty fascinating to think, like, you've had, a, 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 as we mentioned, you know, of course, Loki, you're in the MCU, you, you did Star Wars, we've seen you uh, as an X-Men villain um, in Logan, but you've you've kind of had this history with these very, very intense fandoms. I want to say tracing back to Spice World. I think you, you probably dealt with a lot of a lot of that then for the first time in the late 90s doing Spice World. Look at this. Front page news again. Suppose the whole lot of you have been drowned. Well, we weren't, though, were we? Speak for yourself. I think your daughter, when you were doing Spice World, was kind of the perfect age. Now, did she ever get to meet the Spice Girls? Did that ever come about from, from you doing that film? Oh, she, she'd heard this, uh, you know, it's, it's in the mid-90s. There were still answer machines and little bleeping lights to tell you how many messages you had. And when she heard <laughs> this agent say to me, leave a message saying, will you be the Spice World's manager in Spice World, the movie? She went, she levitated. And she said, I don't care. You know, you get a 50-year contract with Disney. You have to be in Spice World, the movie, so that I can meet them. And that's what happened. So almost every day that I worked, um, I either got her out of school or got her at the end of school to come, come and join. So, And they were amazingly, you know, because they were all 20, 21. So... They were mm-hmm. closer in age to my daughter than they were to me, who was double their <laughs> age. So, um, yeah, they came and she brought all her friends and they accommodated all of that. So oh. and every time I've seen them all these years later, they still ask after her and use her nickname. And so it's very, very sweet. That's so special. Now, are you are you Old Spice to them or is that the in-joke that you've used? on? Old Spice. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. Old Spice. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I have noted that you said that Spice World is specifically why Lena Dunham had thought of you for Jasper for girls, which I think is 
is just fantastic. What the fuck is wrong with you, Shoshana? What's, wrong, Shoshana? What's fucking wrong with me? What's wrong with you? Seriously, Dottie graduated cum laude. She's dating an Egyptian, so she's like super knowledgeable about what's going on there. She is an incredibly inspiring person. But what was the flip side of that? I mean, what was your reaction to, to hearing about that role? Was, was this a surprise for you? Had you heard of girls prior to that moment? Oh, I'd watched all of Girls. Uh, um, yeah. Because again, my daughter was is, is a <laughs> year younger than Lena. So mm -hmm. two years younger than Lena. So she was absolutely obsessed with it. Um, so we watched that together. Um, and then I was working on a movie with Jude Law called Dom Hemingway that, that uh, was movie. written and directed by uh, Richard Shepard. And Richard is married to Jenny Connor, who was the producer of Girls. So, you know, inside story. Um, I thought, oh, well, I, I, I've been offered a part in in Girls because Lena has seen with now. Of course, you know, no, she hadn't. She had seen Spice <laughs> World, the movie, and said, right, okay, you're going to bring that mania and play a coke-addicted you know, nut job who's trying to jump on Jemima Kirk at any given opportunity. So she wrote one episode, and then I did that, and then this, she said, oh, can you do two more? So I did, with enormous pleasure. I, mm -hmm. I really, I had such a good time working with him. I'm making time. In the book, you do mention that with now is, you, I, I have, I pulled the quote because I wanted to make sure I got it right. You said, never before since have I read something that conveys what goes on in my head so accurately. Does it still feel that way to you? Does it still stand out in your mind as a singular? I think because I'd been unemployed for nine months before mm. I got that part, and I was 29 years old, um, which is the age of that character as well, there were so many parallels in my experience and frustrations that I suppose the other thing is that the things that I would love to be able to say in a real life situation but, you know, manners and, you know, civility and all that stuff prevent you from doing it. Whereas Withnell is so undilutedly unfettered in what he says about anything and everything to his cost. You know, he pays the price for it. Um, I thought that is, that is so what I would love to say in a situation to somebody, but of <laughs> course, you know, you don't. Um, so it's the uninhibited, just don't, don't, don't give a fuck completely hedonistic, yeah. selfish way of living um, that I've matured from. So no, <laughs> if I read it now, it would be not what is going on in my head, but it certainly was at the time. But that was 30 years ago, 35 mm -hmm. years ago. Of course, another big portion of the book is, is spent detailing Hudson Hawk and what a production that was. Waldo! Oh, really? 100 million clams! Woo! One. $100 million yes. to Mr. Darwin Mayflower. <laughs> um, I'm curious, you know, what would you say your most, I, I, you know, friendship with San Sandra Bernard, maybe, but what would you say, aside from that, is your most valuable takeaway from your time with Hudson Hawk? Maybe life lesson learn or... Sandra Bernard. <laughs> yeah. Just stay lifelong friends with Sandra. You don't want to be her enemy. <laughs> yeah, that's, I can imagine. <laughs> oh, she's great. I love Sandra. Mm -hmm. She is she is so unequivocally honest and she just doesn't take any prisoners and she's not changed one iota. She's <laughs> she's an amazing person. I absolutely love her. Um you know, and then as the story goes, it's at the premiere of Hudson Hawk where you see Robert Altman again, and that's kind of essentially when he offers you the player and that kicks off this this great series of collaborations with him. With the stars. No stars. No stars. Bruce Willis. I want Bruce Willis. Not Bruce Willis. No Schwarzenegger. Junior Robbins. Now, he's about to star. I think, you know, as you, you talk about, he has this very distinct approach to his work and how he conducts a set. Did that, did you feel any sense of that changing the way you then approached other films or worked with directors in other films? Or was this always like, a, okay, this is an Altman film and this is everything else? <laughs> well, you always hope that the Altman experience is going to go into other movies because he works on film like an ensemble in a theatre company in that there are two salary tiers. So mm -hmm. you know that, like, for instance, on, the, on uh, pret a Porte, which you know, is a disaster, but the experience of making it was quite fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know that Julia Roberts and Sophia Loren, that echelon of people, are all on one payroll. And then 
the lower lot, or which I was, that's on another one. But it's not as extreme as somebody getting 30 or $50 million and you're getting scale. If there's no disparity between somebody getting $50 million and somebody getting you know, $100 a day, um, it means that there's a kind of communal atmosphere and support system that is unique and mm. also invited all the actors and the crew to watch the rushes, the dailies every night so everybody could see what everybody else was doing. So you felt that you were really part of the whole process of how, how it was made and also gave him the opportunity to find out with, a, or be a partisan audience, what was funny or what was moving or what did or didn't work. Whereas almost without exception, every other director, it's very, very, you know, secretive and that you don't see hmm. the dailies. Um, you know, that's something that happens like in the headmaster's office somewhere <laughs> around the corner. Um, Whereas Altman was very, very inclusive and uh, shared everything. And by the same token, if there were 18 actors in a scene, every single person was mic'd up. Whereas, you know, on a movie, the people talking, you know, the, the three people talking or the four people at most talking, they're mic'd up and everybody else is sort of background or switched off. Mm -hmm. Whereas Altman was as interested in the, the far corner of the screen of what was going on there as what was going on center stage. And I think that was what was so idiosyncratic and unique mm. about his talent. Yeah, definitely. Now, is, is that communal aspect, was that also true on the set of a film like Gosford Park where there is this upstairs, downstairs divide? The servants are loyal. I just wanted to be sure you had everything you need. Discreet. You shouldn't sneak up on people like that. Don't worry, it's nobody. Devoted. Thank you. Oh, got some hair on your dress. Thank <laughs> you, <sir. Mr>. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing how people got infected or affected yes. by what class they were playing because usually in my career I've played people in the upstairs <laughs> section of life and so being in the downstairs I can remember one day you know actor that I know really well and worked with before um so you can't sit there when I just sat down on a sofa in the upstairs thing I said what are you talking about he said well you're your servant class. And I said, hello, this is, this, this is a movie. This is not real life. And he just was caught himself short. He realized that he got so taken up into the world of this. Um, so yeah, that amused me enormously. Well, the last thing I will ask you about then is I've done one of these longer form random roles interviews with the great Beth Grant, who you worked on um, a series of unfortunate events with. Disappoint us, Olaf. The burden of our fortune is small potatoes. No, I'm pretty sure it's money. And yes. she she was telling me about that process and how much fun she had, but she mentioned <laughs> that you probably had the earliest call time of all to get the hair and makeup done for that. And I wondered if you had memories of being up very, very early for that role. Oh, yeah. That was at 3 a.m. into the chair to have the bald, the bald cap and all that done. So, um, yeah, that was dedication. You go, you go into sort of zen-like trans mode where you've got two incredibly dedicated, hard-working, talented um, female makeup artists transforming into looking you know, completely bald and much older. So, and then having this huge Rip Van Winkle-like beard and sideburns and glasses. So it was, it's an amazing thing because you go into this, because it's so early in the morning, into a trans-like state um, inadvertently, and they're playing sort of whale music while talking in the background. And then when you when you sort of resurface, you look and you can't you can't believe that you have been turned to this ancient old gizzard. So you know that was always a sweet moment, and I enjoyed it enormously. Yeah. Well, and the union of Richard E. Grant and Beth Grant, the Grants together at last, was exactly. is a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah, it was indeed. 